I'm uh, really excited about this next group of uh, talks. You know, one of the things that I've found really interesting is I've um, traveled really around the world talking to folks about attack. Um, is the, are the organizations from Malaysia to Munich that I've seen that are implementing attack in some way in their socks, in their certs, in their security um, apparata. So, um, in that global spirit, our next speakers, Olaf Hartung and Vincent van Meegem, join us from the Netherlands where they work for Deloitte. Uh, Olaf specializes in building and operationalizing SOC teams through the use of SIEM or log management systems such as Splunk. He is also the author of several security focused applications. And Vincent is passionate about offensive and operational security. He's a red team specialist with a focus on antivirus evasion techniques, and he's the creator of several open source security related tools. Please welcome Olaf Hartong and Vincent van Meegem. All right. Um, so yeah, my name is Vincent. I am a red team operator in the Dutch Deloitte team. Um, I am, uh, well, more of a technical guy. I have a software engineering background. Uh, and I, yeah, just like uh, Rich said, I specialize in, uh, within the team, specialize in uh, antivirus and anti-malware evasion techniques. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Olaf Hartung. I work for Deloitte for now two years, I guess. Um, I have a background in tele and data communications, but primarily arts. I uh, used to be a documentary photographer, um, and then I got back into IT, and I came, yeah, it's Red Hunter, and really passionate about data. I'm also a dad of two little boys. Um, yeah, and in my spare time, I like to bike, snowboard, and so on. Cool. So, um, this should be on now. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about red teaming and how we do that in the Netherlands. Um, we think the uh, definition of red teaming should be a realistic adversarial simulation against, uh, against an organization. And I think it's important to emphasize here that um, the word realistic, because it hasn't always been that way, right? Sorry. Um, uh, because uh, just like many of the other pen test firms out there, we started by conducting these red team tests by going to a client on site and plugging our laptops into their networks and then the primary goal was pretty much becoming domain admin. Uh, and for a little bit more mature clients out there, we had some more realistic objectives, but that was pretty much about it. And what we see nowadays is that a ma far majority of all the operations that we conduct have a fully remote nature where we have to fish in into the organization to uh, get a foothold on a network and where the, op where the objectives of the red team are very clearly defined by an organization's most valuable assets. Also, many of the operations that we do are based on, or at least fed by, a, a very specific threat intelligence uh, and, and uh, uh, OSINT to ensure that, that the threat actor that you're simulating with your red team is actually a realistic one and not something that the organization will probably never face or will not face in the, in the near future. So in the Netherlands, we have uh, an authority is called the, the Dutch Central Bank, and they came up with, like two years ago, with a framework that is called TIBER, uh, which stands for Threat Intelligence Based, Net, uh, based uh, Red Teaming. And uh, this, is, this is a framework or a program that every financial institution in the Netherlands has to conduct at least, uh, at least uh, once uh, in two years. And the, the threat intelligence and the red teaming phases have to be conducted by a third party supplier. And then the, the, the Dutch Central Bank is sort of supervising that program uh, uh, to ensure that everything is going, going uh, um, across the, like, according to the framework uh, definitions. Um, and we do, we do uh, kind of similar uh, things for uh, the operations that we conduct. So we have a threat intelligence phase where we, um, map out the, the threat actor that, or threat actors that an organization faces, uh, where we do very specific OSINT on the organization, where we also try to focus a lot on the social vulnerabilities of the 
organization. Uh, and then threat intelligence, the output phase is really to come up with, with two or three very specific scenarios on how to attack this organization, that the red team basically just has to implement those uh, scenarios. And to give you an example of those scenarios, uh, we did like a, a red team, I think a couple of months back for a financial institution. <clears throat> And uh, the Trendel guys at some point found these two employees that were switching jobs every two years. And they also noticed that those employees were at their final, um, well, at the organization that had been already two years. And so they thought, okay, let's, let's send these, uh, these two employees a phishing mail from a recruiter uh, and attack the organization that way. And we as a red team turned out to be very specific, uh, very successful. Uh, and we, uh, we were very successful in, in compromising the organization that way. So threat intelligence here is, is main, main goal is to come out with very specific scenarios uh, that it form an input for, for the red team. And then the red team basically conducts those, uh, those scenarios, executes them, and then afterwards there is a, a blue team uh, debrief typically and uh, also a, remedi a, remedi a remediation plan. Um, and where typically some deviations happen on depending on, on what the organization uh, uh, needs. And Olaf is going to talk about that in a, in a few moments. And also how we use this, uh, how we use attack to, to basically uh, facilitate this, this process even better. But there are still some, some issues and, and pitfalls to this approach, right? Um, Blue teaming can be really, or red teaming can be really antagonizing for, uh, for an organization, especially if you're conducting it for the first time. Um, we've had instances where uh, the blue team got tipped off by, uh, by either the white team directly or indirectly, or sometimes even a, a third party vendor uh, that isn't even security related. And then they start to suddenly hunt in an unrealistic fashion that basically defeats the purpose of your red team because it's not really a realistic simulation anymore. Um, sometimes, well, we come in one year and we deliver a report, and then we come in the next year, and then we can like copy-paste 80% of the, of the report of, of last year because the organization really hasn't fixed any of the vulnerabilities reported last year. That's also, uh, uh, <clears throat> well, happening uh, sometimes. Um, sometimes they heard you are an audit firm, um, and they think uh, they come to you uh, to, to Deloitte because they think uh, our trick is just not taking their compliance boxes. Uh, but I think the, the most important problem or pitfall is that it's a blue team that lacks the skills and capabilities uh, and knowledge to follow up on the, the findings of the, of the red team. Because this is really where the improvement of the organization, the security posture of the organization has to, uh, has to be... Um, uh, conducted and it also we also see is that there is still in in, in our industry a very much this notion of, of red versus blue in a, in a red team uh, exercise where um, the red team is sort of willing not to share their TTPs or their, 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 their uh, techniques on how to bypass certain uh, blue team uh, uh, control of, well blue team detections and the blue team is not really willing to share any of their, their detection techniques. <clears throat> and this sort of, this sort of comes down to a, a rather inefficient approach into uh, improving the security organization, uh, the security posture of the organization. Uh, and we think at the look we have a, have a better approach at doing more efficiently improvement of that uh, security. And to talk more about that, I'd like to give it to Ola. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so basically what we initially want to do is get rid of this discarded mindset, right? So the red team is usually focused on, on really getting their objectives done um, and keeping their cars close to their chest. Um, while on the other hand, if the blue team finds out there will be a red team exercise, they're quite anxious maybe or scared what would turn up and, and what will management say if they find a lot of stuff. And, and so... Um, this isn't the ideal situation to start with. Uh, they should be both contributing to improvement instead of, yeah, vice versa, uh, battling each other. Um, so, so what, what we try to do with uh, with our red teaming approach is create a more constructive environment where both of the parties have to adapt 
uh, and more, more towards a maturity boost for the organization, which is uh, both uh, in their benefit. Um, and, and essentially, this is where, where the, the, the company will benefit most from. Um, if the red team will, will uh, work, as Vincent said, and the, the blue team doesn't get either the management buy-in to, to fix it, because sometimes that's the issue, they simply get, don't get granted the time or the, uh, or the capability uh, uh, to, to learn and to improve themselves, and they're constantly fighting a, a wash of uh, alerts coming in. So, so what we try to do is, is, is a system in, in, in getting there, basically. Um, and as Vincent uh, told us, uh, or told you already, uh, um, we basically work in three phases. So we have, uh, we have a threat intelligence phase, uh, then we have a red team phase and a blue team phase. And what we try to do is map everything that we find in threat intel already, uh, where, where it's applicable to the attack framework, um, which will guide the, the, the red team already, uh, then how, how they can draft their scenario based on these specific TDPs. Um, and so, so for, for the blue team um, um, person that will join that uh, exercise from, from, from our end, you will already start preparing a lot of work. Um, uh, so, so everything that the red team is probably going to do, um, and so that he can explain to the customer later on how they can uh, detect it if they didn't. So in, es in essence, we all speak attack. Um, so everything is mapped to the, to, the, to the attack framework. And in essence, this, this provides us with a general language that when we go into the purple teaming phase, we understand each other. And we basically are not in a room <laughs> trying to converse like this, right? <laughs> this, this is inefficient. So, um, sorry. Um, so how does this work in practice? First, um, as told, uh, we will start gathering a lot of intelligence uh, from, from our closed sources, open sources. Uh, we'll map, map everything to a, a nice document and then provide that to the, to the red team guys that start preparing a, a scenario, or at least three. So for instance, let's say we're targeting a bank. Um, there will be a lot of uh, industry-specific in intel. There will be some, some market local market intel that will be uh, applicable, but we'll also look at where is this company going? Like in, in Europe, there's the PSD2 initiative where, where basically there's an API open for every bank and you can, you can build your own, your own tool against it and you're, you're helping uh, do financial services. Um, so that might also be an indicator or, or something to work with for the red team. Um, uh, it could also be uh, uh, we, we try to uh, um, uh, reenact the Lazarus uh, campaign where we uh, move laterally through the network uh, using WMI or some other bingo uh, bingo items. Um, next phase is uh, red team goes to work. Um, they try to stay as close to the to the draft scenarios as possible. Um, however, there's always deviation uh, required in, in a different uh, in a different company, none of the same. Um, and during this red team exercise. There will be a blue team member from our end present to observe what the, what the red team is doing. Um, and in the meantime, the client's blue team is oblivious to what is going on, like, like a standard red team. Um, this this uh, is deliberate because otherwise, if they know there's a red team coming in, they'll, yeah, they'll work differently than they used to or they're normally doing. Uh, so what, what our blue team guy is also doing is, is observing uh, whether they are detecting some of those uh, activities that are being done by, uh, by the red team and also how they respond to it. Um, and uh, during the whole exercise, the, also the red team is, is minutely recording everything they do. Um, and this will all be used as a, as a, as a foundation for, for, the, for the purple exercise. Uh, by this time, the, the client's blue team will, will be informed or hopefully they are aware, are aware already. Maybe they found some stuff, maybe they found everything. Um, usually, in our experience, that isn't the case, but yeah, they're, 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 yeah. Well, sometimes they find a lot, sometimes they find a little. Um, most of the time, we're, 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 yeah, we're then going through the, for the whole scenario. So the red team explains every step they took, um, and our blue team person augments that with a lot of contextual information, uh, what log sources you could use, um, what kind of uh, firewall rules you should have, GPOs, and so on. 
Um, and then they'll, uh, we'll, we'll go through that, uh, and every step of the way we'll have a look on how uh, the data is coming in, if it's available, if it's, if it's not, then we'll, um, we'll reenact the situation to see if it's, it's being logged in, maybe the retention is gone. And if it's not there at all, we'll help them guide uh, or, or draft a plan how to, uh, to onboard this data and, um, and, and, and get it later on. Uh, for the data that is available, we'll help them draft an a initial uh, use case, a high-level use case, um, which won't be only focused on our uh, executed TTP, because otherwise you have tunnel vision and you don't do, don't do anything with that. The next attacker will be doing it in a different fashion. So, um, so then in the next phase, um, the, the client itself uh, generally starts onboarding logs, um, start developing use cases, um, maybe implementing another tool, EDR, um, whatever they like. Um, and essentially, we'll give them a couple of weeks to a few months to do so, the, kind of dependent on, on what, they, what they want. Um, and then we do it all again. So the red team starts uh, uh, doing a similar attack, uh, still at, uh, very close to the scenario, maybe using a little different TTPs to see if they didn't really uh, create a tunnel vision uh, uh, use case. Um, so, so the blue team isn't aware uh, of, of the exact moment. Of course, they are aware that it will happen again. But this might be, like I said, a couple of weeks, a couple of months. So usually they kind of forget about it. Um, uh, but they, they should be uh, more, more ready for this. So maybe they detect a lot, which is really good. Uh, usually they, they have a significant improvement, um, uh, which we can then evaluate in the, in the next phase. Um, and, and help them with, with some, some more tweaks or more improvements. Uh, or sometimes we have, just have to help them uh, with the whole thing because yeah, they, they took very long, or it was very hard to onboard certain data. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll guide them again with, uh, with some uh, additional development. And then hopefully they've grown uh, and the exercise is complete. We'll file a report and evaluate with them. Um, and that's basically the, the way we do it. So, um, so some, some takeaways for them. Uh, for, from a blue team perspective, like myself, it's really interesting to see how a red team operates, what decisions they make, what kind of techniques they use. Every, every red team is different. Every, everyone has their two preferences. One uses PowerShell, the other one does FWMI. Uh, some other guys do, do it a completely different way. So that's really Really nice to see from a blue team perspective how, how they operate very, very close angle. You can ask questions, they can do it again, they can do it in a different way. So this is really nice. Um, from our, our perspective, it's, it's extremely helpful to have uh, um, uh, attack as a, as a foundation to, to reference upon, to focus, uh, to, to really measure where, where you're doing well, where you're doing not so well. Um, well, and a lot of examples have been shown already today. So, and it's and it's an extreme skill boost for everybody. Uh, usually, in eval, everybody is loving these approaches because uh, even the red team learns a lot. Yeah, because eventually the red team is also getting better insights in how the blue team operates, how their defense mechanism works, uh, and and eventually then the question for the red team is okay, how can I then? Uh, if they detect all the, the stuff that I did uh, last time, how can I make sure that next time uh, my, my techniques are fall falling off the radar again uh, to make sure that we, that we, again, try to improve on, on the security posture of the organization. So it's really, um, yeah, like a, a skill boost for both teams, not only the blue team. Thank you very much. So we have plenty of time for questions. So we have the throw mic. First of all, does anyone have any questions? We'll throw you the mic um, while people are getting their courage uh, up. Um, so it's interesting. I, I was just in Europe a few weeks ago and was learning of, and you know, was in a presentation hearing about Tiber. So what do you think is the sort of the number one takeaway with respect to attack and Tiber and what people could leave with in terms of a of a message? So yeah, I think that's a, that's a good question. Um, the, the, the good thing about Tiber is that it's, um, 
really focused on realistic adversarial uh, simulation um, and uh, attack really forms a foundation for uh, realistic uh, adversarial simulations because it's actually sort of mapping all the the things that uh, the traductors are already doing. Um, so it forms like a foundation for this entire uh, Tiber approach, I think, in, uh, uh, where, we, uh, where we do those things. Okay. Questions? Okay, let's throw the mic first there. Then. Hello. Oh, there we go. Uh, hey, when you're doing the uh, purple teaming and you're reiterating through the same attack scenario after blue team implements some of the improvements, how do you know when to stop reiterating? We only we only reiterate once. Oh, only one time. Okay. That's usually the thing. So if the if the client wants it, it will do it again. But usually the second iteration already uh, is being detected a lot better, and they find a lot of a lot more. So they have they have, they still have some stuff to work with. So we can come back after a while, but usually um, then you, you would give them another couple of months, which is usually also the the, the 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 schedule where they would do the whole exercise again. So then you have a new scenario, and that might help them improve more. So you would take the gaps from the first scenario if there are some, and then just use them in another one a couple months out. Potentially, yes. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Question over here. They throw him the mic and we'll we're passing. You got it. <laughs> Hello. Good throw. Um, you mentioned early uh, in your presentation that you would fish your way in. Um, obviously, that's the easy way in for pretty much everywhere. <laughs> uh, do you have engagements where that's not an option? Uh, that's off the table as a technique, and you have to break in. And and how often does is that? successful on you, uh, your red teaming side and, and from the blue teaming side, um, when that is the, the way in, um, do you have to operate or report back to the customer in a different way? Yeah, so uh, that's an interesting question. We did, uh, I think two months back, uh, an engagement in China uh, where the objective was to get physical access first and then get network access via hardware implant. Uh, kind of similar that uh, John talked about this morning. We used a Raspberry Pi uh, based device. Um, we we'll sort of talked our way in, uh, cloned some, some, some badges based on pictures that we found online on the OSINT face. Uh, and then when we got access, we found a conference room where we could plug in the, the hardware implant. Then from that hardware implant, that would create a remote connection out to servers that we, uh, that we owned. Uh, through the firewall, so you could also use a 4G uh, chip there, but use the to uh, to go outbound over their own firewall, uh, and then we further compromised the, the organization. Uh, using the hardware. I was thinking more along the lines of uh, exploitation of external facing assets. Yeah, sometimes that happens as well. Uh, in in organizations that are a little bit less less mature, they sometimes have. Uh, well, vulnerable systems, outdated, uh, outdated software, uh, in internet facing, uh, and then you suddenly end up in their Azure, uh, Azure cloud env environment or Amazon cloud environment. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions Oops, over there? Ah. So uh, based off of your uh, attack use, uh, are you guys basing any of your current TTPs based on like your clients' uh, uh, prior attacks, like doing some research? That way, you can just use pretty much the same style of of, of entry level, so that you so so uh, uh, same Pete's TTPs and and whatnot, so that so that when they can determine that they've improved on, say, a former like like positive hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's definitely happened in the past. So then we. Try to emulate that attacker and, and try to get as much as possible. Uh, try to tell around that attacker group and uh, and other other measures that they're using. So we're, we yeah sometimes we completely replay it, but that's for purple team exercise maybe maybe a bit stretching stretching the the, the concept because um, as as you said they try to improve a lot already. So then it's then it's easier to evaluate if if they did and 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 try to work work more in in a smaller in a smaller setting instead of doing this whole exercise which is uh, a bit more expensive so that could be a reason not to do it in that way um ideally i'd like to do it in that way definitely um because, because then it, 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 it skips a little bit of a step but then you we could also go go a little bit deeper into into what they 
could, could be improving even more. All right, thank you. Okay, we have time for another question or two. Over there. Finally, that side of the room. I was starting to. <laughs> Um, so, do you guys allow the blue team to take any actions when you guys are doing the assessment, or is it more of a sit back and take notes and monitor? Um, or we, depends. We make the arrangements uh, with the customer. So, so some of the customers we want them to do everything. So, if we uh, compromise a system that they just uh, reinstall it and so on, and we have to find another way, this, this is one of the approaches that, that we do. And sometimes we only ask them to inform us. And, but then that also gets them off, right? Because then they know, right. hey, why can't we take action? And then the whole scenario becomes less realistic. So I think you people do the, don't want to do that. You know, gotcha. Like mm -hmm. And also it's very valuable for the organization to actually uh, um, conduct the threat hunting that starts to happen when there is some detection, well, some alarms uh, in their scene, uh, because that's, that's typically a process that is not uh, uh, not uh, trained often organization. So one of the recent examples was that we had is where we are uh, also, we, we have a written uh, incident response retainer with a certain customer. And they also hired us for a red team uh, or for a scenario like this. And then eventually it boiled up so far that the, 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 the board wanted to have the IR uh, 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 retainer effective, effective, made effective. So, then we had to tell them, sorry, uh, it's us. Um, but it was great for them. It was a great learning experience to see how the whole procedure was, was followed, and it was actually done very well. Um, so that part of, part of the test was very successful. Great. Time for one more question. Right there. I'm going to stand back and throw <laughs> Maybe if we could blitz. Um, Years ago, I was concerned with red teams limiting themselves to uh, the familiar and the comfortable. Uh, are you finding uh, with attack and Tiber that uh, uh, they are broadening and diversifying their uh, uh, portfolio of attacks and such? Yes, definitely. Um, especially Tiber is uh, a program that is done for or well mostly conducted for financial institutions that already are a lot more mature in terms of security and we see there that they adapt very quickly to uh, the techniques that a red team has used or that we or that the threat actor that we're simulating um, and that very often we have to, well, if we conduct it yearly, then we have to pretty much change a lot of the tactics that we used in the, uh, uh, well, in the previous year. So it's uh, pretty effective. All right, I think we are out of time. Please join me in thanking Olaf and Vincent.